Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim distinguished guests brothers and sisters on behalf of the National Youth Council let me welcome brother Ahmad Didat and brother Abdullah Didat today here again the discussion today is Muhammad the greatest uh, as I mentioned yesterday, uh, Brother Ahmad Didat is the president of the International Propagation Center in Durban, South Africa. And he will be talking on the topic Muhammad the Greatest. After his lecture, it will be question time. Brothers and sisters, those of you who wish to question may walk up to the microphones here and ask the question and Brother Didat will answer you. So without delay, I present to you Brother Ahmad Didat. Auzu billahi min shaitan rajim. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Wa innaka la ala khulukin azim. Sadaq Allah. Sadaq Allah Maran Azim. Mr. Chairman and brethren, the subject, Muhammad the Greatest, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you see, it is very easy for anyone to praise his hero, to adulate his benefactor and boost him to the skies. It's very easy. And we always have a tendency to do that, our own heroes. But if tribute, testimony, if it comes from the outsider, from the opposition, then it is tribute indeed. Allah Bari Ta'ala, He praises His Prophet Wasallam, our Holy Prophet. In the verse that I quoted you from the Holy Quran, it says, وَإِنَّكَ لَا عَلَىٰ خُلُقٍ عَظِيمٍ So most certainly thou, O Muhammad وسلم, standest on the highest pinnacle of behavior. I don't know whether you know where to find this in the Quran. I am quoting you the Quran. I am sure you sense that, that it is the Quran. Where? You see, this ayah occurs in chapter Al-Qalam There is a surah chapter in the Quran called Al-Qalam Verse ayah number 3 وَإِنَّكَ لَا عَلَىٰ خُلُقِ النَّسِيمِ Now in a volume of this size in the Quran Where do you find it? You see it is a very good practice Whenever anybody quotes you the Quran And he gives you a reference If you have a Quran at home Please go and check it out. Not that you distrust the speaker, but for your own benefit. Because once you see it again with your own eyes and you read it, it will become your permanent property. In other words, you will know exactly and you will be able also to reproduce it to others, explain to others. So this is in Surah Al-Qalam. Where do you find Al-Qalam? I take it that every Muslim has a Quran at home most probably the Arabic Quran and in the Arabic Quran the Mashaf it's very difficult for us to find because we are not so conversant with surahs but if you have a translation like this one that I have in my hand here it is by a certain Abdullah Yusuf Ali this particular Quran you see is the most beautiful production that has come out so far best translation so far it has an ayah by ayah translation verse by verse like our Ghari he read it from surah what what surah al fatiha al fatiha means the opening now if you don't know where to find this, that was the easiest surah to find you know where as soon as you open the quran begins with Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen, easy to find, easy to find, Surah Fatiha. But if you didn't know 
Or if you told a non-Muslim that this is in Surah Fatiha, where will you find Fatiha? So in this translation there is an index at the back, just like a dictionary, under F, look for Fatiha and it will tell you chapter number 1, easy to find. He looks for Fatiha and it will tell you number 1, Surah 1, chapter 1. I said Surah Al-Qalam, look under Q, Qalam, it will tell you 68 and 68 is easy to find because every page is numbered. What surah? What surah? Every page is numbered. So once you find 68, ayah number 3, easy to find. That is one way of getting at what I gave you reference. Surah Al-Kalam, verse number 3. There is another way of getting at this ayah. And that is that Allah is telling us that our Nabi Kareem Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, He stands on the highest pinnacle of behavior. So, there is a, in the index look for Muhammad and he'll tell you Muhammad, different different things about Muhammad and he'll tell you the highest pattern of conduct, best behavior and you look that, he'll tell you chapter 68 verse number 3, so easy to find. Once you have a translation like this, everything is on your fingertips, whatever you want to know, you want to know about marriage, look up M. Under M, you find marriage. It tells you whom you can marry, whom you can't marry. And so many other aspects of marriage in Islam. You will know about divorce. Where do you find divorce? Look under D. It will tell you divorce. You will see the Surah Talaq. Or do you find Surah Talaq? It will tell you chapter so and so. What do you want to know? Everything on your fingertips. I don't know whether you have these Qurans available here. I was trying to help some people here. I said, look man, I want to have some Qurans sent here. But so far I haven't come across people enthusiastic enough to discuss this matter. Who and what, what you're going to do and how. But inshallah I hope to be able to arrange something that you can also have access to this translation if you already haven't got it here in the country. So Allah Ta'ala testifies in the Quran that his messenger Muhammad he is on the highest pinnacle of behavior. But I said, real tribute comes from the enemy, the outsider. And to give you references to what the outsider has to say, I now refer you to a certain Michael H. Hart, American. This American just recently published a book called The Hundred, The One Hundred or the greatest hundred in history the most influential hundred men in history from Hazrat Adam alayhi salam up to current times who is the most influential person and this man American Michael H. Hart described as an astronomer mathematician and historian he makes a research of the most influential men in history and he gives us this list of 100 great names and then he puts them in the order of seniority greatness and this American he puts our Nabi Kareem sallallahu alayhi wasallam number one Muhammad number one Muhammad we are very happy and a Christian in America publishes a book, some 572 pages, costing some times ago $15 each. And he's telling his customers, the Americans, Christians and Jews, 200 million Christians and 6 million Jews. He's telling them all that Muhammad, the prophet of his opposition, he is number one. And the own hero, his own hero, his own God and Savior, Jesus Christ, is number three. That is amazing. Muhammad is number one and his Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ is number three. So we can well ask, why would an American in America go and do a silly thing like that? Provoking his customers. Yes. You see, my people in South Africa, we are business people. Most of us, we are business people. And the businessman knows that the customer is always right. You don't argue with your customers if you want to do business. For a successful businessman, you don't argue with your customers. 
this man is provoking his customers telling them what they don't want to hear what they don't want to listen that Muhammad is number one and their Lord and Savior Jesus Christ number three I say account for that you ask the skeptic Christian atheist agnostic account for that and there are people you know skeptical people they can always tell you says you see this man must have been bribed by some Arab you see the Arabs are very good they're spending a lot of money so we hear I don't know how much the money they spent here on the Maldives Islands I don't know whether they know that you exist I don't know the great grandfathers you know I understand from North Africa somebody came along Alhamdulillah a few centuries back and he introduced Islam to you people Alhamdulillah and you are Muslims but since then it looks like they must have lost contact with you altogether they don't know that you exist but the Arabs they say are very good at spending money you see one of our dear brothers I don't know whether I should name him Adnan Khushukji Adnan Khushukji he has a South African wife and they had a breakup now of marriage but every time that this wife was mentioned in the newspapers Adnan's wife the South African woman every time her name was men mentioned it was also mentioned that she's got an illegitimate daughter in Johannesburg you know a zina daughter of zina hers so Adnan goes and marries this woman and she is traveling in the Mediterranean Sea with her boyfriend lover Rudolf Churchill the grandson of Winston Churchill she is traveling in the Mediterranean on Adnan Khoshakji's yacht not the small things that you have nice yacht maybe worth a few million dollars and she wanted to see color TV on the yacht she couldn't see color TV she can see black and white but it wasn't good enough for her she wanted to have this color TV beam directly for her for, by satellite and that was costing our brother thirty thousand dollars an hour for his dear wife to see color TV and enjoy with her boyfriend on the yacht so if a guy can do that why can't he give ten thousand dollars to Michael H. Hart say look here's ten thousand for you say a few good words about my Muhammad why can't he do that I say it's possible but it's not probable to enter the mind of our brothers to do a thing like that another of our brother from the Middle East he goes to the Australian waters Mediterranean I'm sorry Australian waters to catch what is called blue marlin it's a fish I don't know whether you have around here blue marlin it's a fighting fish if you hook it you just don't pull it in you don't reel it in it gives you a good fight and at times it comes out of the water as if it's a, like a bird flying out of the water it's a very fighting fish blue marlin so he went to catch blue marlin and he didn't catch anything but the people who were helping him to bait the hook he gave them two thousand dollars each tip 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 you know tip two thousand dollars each if our brothers can do that why can't they give ten thousand dollars to Michael H. Hart say man here's ten thousand say a few good words about my Muhammad I say again it's possible but it's not probable then in the Times magazine July 15 1974 American magazine they were a series of essays under the heading who are history's great leaders and different people sociologists psychologists military men philosophers they all gave the heroes who whom they esteemed to be the greatest leaders of mankind leaders this first one was from the point of view of influence the most influential men in history Muhammad was number one the most influential look at it today a thousand million Muslims are influenced by his teachings we as a people as a whole we don't touch alcohol we have some drunkards among us yes whether among the Arabs or among us in South Africa we have we have we have a black sheep like any other community but as a people as a whole 
thousand million people don't touch that abominable stuff. Thousand million. Influence. You see, we pray five times a day. In my country, I say we are the most hygienic people in the country. So don't, don't look at this. Don't look at my beard that I didn't shave for so many days. Don't look at that. But personal hygiene, there is not another community in my country that can say that we are cleaner than you. You are the most hygienic people. The Muslims. Where did it come from? Muhammad. Influence. Influence. So here now, leadership. So different people give the heroes, each according to his light. Some say Hitler. Really? Greatness. Greatness of leadership. They are not talking about good or bad. That you know he was a good man. No, no, no. They say greatness of leadership. At his behest, 90 million Germans were prepared to go on the march, war path. Death, destruction or destiny. They went to destruction. But 90 million Germans were ready to march at his behest. Whatever he says, goes. When he said march into Russia, they marched into Russia, attacked Russia 2,000 kilometers non-stop. Slaughter, slaughter, stop, slaughter. 2,000 kilometers, non-stop. Eventually, you know, when the war stopped, by that time they had killed 20 million Russians. See, the guy was great. Leader, as a leader. Good or bad? We are not talking about good or bad. Some say Mussolini, some says Mahatma Gandhi, some say Confucius. Each according to his knowledge about his hero. See, I came across a Portuguese. You had very little contact with them. I came across a Portuguese. You see, in South Africa, tourists, they come along, and I conduct visitors to the mosque, the masjid. And he happened to be a Portuguese, chatting, chatting. And he tells me that Dr. Salazar was the, is the greatest man that ever lived. Dr. Salazar. Have you heard of him? Yes. Well, I, my people did. At that time also I didn't know, never heard the name Salazar, but to him, Salazar is the greatest man that ever lived. Well, that's his experience, like a frog in the pond. He only knows the other frogs. He doesn't know what's happening in the ocean, that there might be whales in the ocean, he doesn't know. He only knows this one frog knows the other frogs. So each according to his knowledge, he's giving his heroes. Some said Hitler, some said Mussolini, some say Mahatma Gandhi, some say Moses, some say Jesus, some said Muhammad. Among all these contributors, there is one by the name of Jules Masterman. Jules Masterman. He is described as a United States psychoanalyst. You know psychoanalysts? People who analyze people's minds. Psychologists. If you are mentally, you know, you are not behaving rightly, they take you to the psychoanalyst. Just a little beyond, too clever, little beyond, this has to be taken to a lunatic asylum. I don't know whether you have any asylums here. You need them? No. <laughs> Alhamdulillah, you don't need lunatic asylums here. We need them, you know, in the westernized, civilized countries, advanced countries, we need asylums to put people where too clever. So the psychoanalyst, his job is to find lunacy in a genius. So he is presented with Muhammad and he's looking for lunacy in the man. But he comes to other conclusions. But before he comes to his conclusions, he says that when we are looking for greatness, we must know what we are looking for. I said Muhammad the greatest. That's the subject. Now we are not comparing Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa with Allah. Astaghfirullah. It's man to man we are comparing. We say Muhammad Ali. Heard of Muhammad Ali, the boxer? The greatest. Right. We mean in boxing. Right? In boxing. Somebody else, a Gary player in my country, golfer, greatest golfer we have produced. Maybe you didn't hear about it. But as a golfer, somebody else, greatest philosopher, greatest historian, greatest this and greatest that, depending upon what you are looking for. So this, my, my, my Jews master, man, he's a Jew. He is a psychoanalyst of the Chicago University. 
paid servant of the American government. He is doing this research on his own and he says, when we are looking for greatness of leadership in a man, we must try and look for three main points. Number one, that that person, whoever he is, number one, that that person is interested in the welfare of the lead. He is interested in your welfare, not in milking cows for himself. It's what I can, I can get out of you. As a leader, not what, I, what he can get out of the people, but what he can, their welfare. How can I benefit them? Number one. Number two, that that person must provide for unity of belief. And number three, he must be able to create a social organization in which people feel relatively secure. These three things. Unity of belief, welfare of the people, unity of belief, and a social organization in which people feel relatively secure. With these three standards, he searches history and he analyzes Louis Pasteur. Louis Pasteur was a man who discovered the microbe, the germ. First man to find out what the germ is, creating so many sicknesses. He was a benefactor to mankind. Leader in medicine. Louis Pasteur, Salk, who discovered the anti-TB vaccine. And he analyzes Mahatma Gandhi and Confucius and Moses and Jesus and Muhammad sallallahu and he comes to the conclusion that perhaps the greatest leader of all time was Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa and to a lesser degree whatever Muhammad did he said Moses did the same Moses is his hero that Christian he says Muhammad number one and his hero number three this man he says Muhammad number one and his hero number two why would he do that? But now, number one, catering for the welfare of the lead, he's leading. He says, not people like Reverend Jim Jones. I don't know you heard, Reverend Jim Jones in Jonestown, Guyana. This man had a following. He created a church, a Christian church. See, they have in my country over 1,000 different churches and denominations among the Christians and 3,000 among the blacks. Blacks means Africans, Christians, Indian, Christians, colored Christians, white Christians, I'm sorry, leave the whites out, blacks. The whites have a thousand different churches and denominations, they're fighting like cats and dogs among themselves. Each saying that you are gonna to go to hell, you haven't got the right path. They have the Jehovah's Witnesses, they go and knock at other Christians' doors, they say, what is the name of God? What is his name? So the other guy says, God. He said, God is not a name. What's his name? He says, his name is Jehovah. Another guy comes along, he knocks at the door. He said, what is the Sabbath day? Sabbath day. Because the Christians, they go to church on Sundays. And Sunday is not the Sabbath. Sabbath means seven. And according to the Jewish calculation, the seventh day is Saturday. Yawmul Sap is Saturday, not Sunday. So there is a group called the Seventh Day Adventists among the Christians. So they go and knock at people's doors and say, come on, come on. What is the Sabbath day? Well, the guy's puzzled. Say, well, Saturday, man. But you go to church on Sunday. You fools, you don't know when the Sabbath is. The other guy says, you fool, you don't know what the name of God is. Another fellow comes along. He says, you. Baptism. Are you baptized? So some of them they sprinkle water for baptism. He says, no, you fool, you must be immersed and be taken out. They are fighting like cats and dogs. They are looking for converts through their own churches. There is no peace among them. But they are united all when it comes to Islam. How to knock hells into the Muslims that they know. But among themselves they fight like cats and dogs. So this guy, Reverend Jim Jones, he created a church of his own. And he was milking these people, exploiting these people. And he was being caught out by the American government. And before he could be caught and exposed, he found that the best way out of his difficulty is to make his followers, everybody to commit suicide. And he succeeded. 
His leadership, I think he's the greatest. I think he beats everybody, Allah. A man, there were 910 of his followers on that in Jonestown. 910. He made 100% to commit suicide. You know, 100% of you, I, if I told you, I said, look, it is night outside, I can't make you to believe it. Now, man, what miracles I perform. If I tell you, I said, look, this is not water, this is lemonade. You know, one or two, I can bluff you. I said, this is lemonade, I'm drinking. Very sweet, but you know I'm bluffing you. That guy succeeded, 910 of his followers, 100% to drink lemonade, it was lemonade. Laced with cyanide, cyanide was put inside and he made everybody to drink. And they all drank, 910 and with him 911, 100% dead. Everybody. And it was found out that in the meantime, this man, Reverend Jim Jones, had salted away in the banks of the world 15 million dollars in his own account. So all these followers were his milking cows. He was exploiting them. So no, whoever the leader is, number one, he is interested in your welfare. Unity of belief. Look at it. We have our little petty differences. Alhamdulillah, you know, you are a unique community among the Muslims of the world. You are all Muslims, Alhamdulillah. You are all Shafis, Alhamdulillah. You are all one language group, Alhamdulillah. Amazing, amazing. You know, this is a unique situation. See, otherwise there are all these problems, racial problems. Where you come from? You have all types of blood mixed in you and you accept it. We are Maldivians. We are Muslims. Finish. The other guy says, I'm a Sayyid, I'm an Afghan, I'm a Pathan, I'm what and what and what not. Shh. I am a Hanafi, this is a Shafi, this is a Malaki, this is a Hanbali. We have our little petty differences. There is no doubt about that. But thousand million Muslims as a whole, we believe in the one and only Allah Wadahullah Sharik. We all recite the Kalima. We say, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah. We all believe 100% that there is but one Allah and Muhammad is his last and final messenger. Unity of belief. And a social organization in which people feel relatively secure. This is the type of community it creates. Relatively you are secure. You don't need dogs to guard your houses. Look, you haven't got dogs. Why haven't you got dogs? Because you've got no thieves, no rogues, rogues robbers to knock and break your house down. Why haven't you got dogs? They are good animals, faithful animals for keeping the burglar away. But you have no burglars. You don't need dogs. <laughs> you don't drink, you don't brawl in the streets because you don't drink. Can you see? A social or I am safe, I feel safe walking around. Whether it's midnight, I haven't had the opportunity of walking around at midnight because too many puddles of water. But otherwise I might have taken walks at random and I know I am safe. Wallah, you see that? There's no drunks there. They say, hey, where is this guy going? Hey, where you come from? No, nobody. Peace, peace, peace. A social organization in which people feel relatively secure. You can say 100%, nobody is 100%, but relatively secure. These are the three standards by which Jews, Masterman, he said, Our Nabi Kareem, وسلم, Muhammad Mustafa, is the greatest leader of all times. So I said, How does it come about? Account for it. So again, the skeptic might say, somebody bribed him also. He said, look man, here's 10,000 for you. Say a few good words about my Muhammad. And he did it. I say, again, it's possible, but it's not probable. These things are possible, but it's not probable to enter the mind of the Muslim to do a thing like that. But going back in history, in 1854, a Frenchman by the name of La Martine, he wrote a book called The History of the Turks. And in this history of the Turks, the Turks as you know, incidentally they happen to be Muslims. So while talking about the Turks, he happened to mention about our Nabi, Muhammad sallallahu And he makes a mention about him. This Lamartine in 1854. 
and he gives us this is the great the, 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 the ingeniousness of the westerner he is looking for qualities which we didn't think of influence leadership that other man social organization unity of belief welfare of the led all these are different standards of looking at a man a greatness in a man this Lamartine he says if greatness of purpose smallness of means and outstanding results are the three criteria of human greatness who could dare to compare any great man in modern history with Muhammad I hope you don't mind it is a bit warm here and you don't mind me rolling my sleeves he said if greatness of purpose smallness of means and outstanding results are the three criteria of human greatness who could dare to compare any great man in modern history with Muhammad he's daring he's daring his people the westerners bring your candidates anybody to compare with this man but these are the three standards he gives greatness of purpose what the man is out to do what is Muhammad out to do a reclamation of the whole of mankind Allah testifies in the Quran that we have not sent you a Muhammad except as a mercy alameen to the whole of creation we have not sent you but for this that you are a mercy to the whole of creation alameen alam means the world and alameen means the worlds that's his, his mission greatness of purpose smallness of means so how does he start before he is born his father dies by the time he is six his mother dies his grandfather Abdul Muttalib is looking after the child very soon he dies then he is looking after his uncle Abu Talib's goat once at the age of 12 he went with his uncle to Syria on a trade journey a 12 year old boy, lad no education no royalty to back him up no political party to back him up nothing smallness of means and outstanding results 1000 million Muslims today outstanding results are the three criteria standards of judging of human greatness so who could dare to compare any great man in modern history with Muhammad he dares produce your candidates and he ends his beautiful tribute by saying philosopher orator apostle legislator warrior conqueror of ideas the restorer of rational beliefs of a cult without images the founder of 20 terrestrial empires and of one spiritual empire that is Muhammad with regards all standards all standards whereby human greatness may be measured we may well ask is there any man greater than he is there any man greater than he and the answer is reposed in the question meaning no man greater than Muhammad the greatest man that ever lived was Muhammad I'm asking who bribed him 1854 the whole Muslim world was in the cutters whole Muslim world except for three or four nominally independent Muslim states every Muslim nation was under subjugation India my own country was under the British Indonesia was under the Dutch and look all around the French and the Portuguese everywhere they had conquered Muslim lands Mozambique a Muslim territory like yours was it would have just fallen the same way that Mozambique had fallen Mozambique today 60% of the people of Mozambique are still Muslims after 500 years of Portuguese rule Mozambique was a Muslim country it was the Muslim governor of the place when the Portuguese with the superior gunpowder knocked hills in him and camp captured that part of the world his name was Musa bin Baik Musa bin Baik was the governor but the Portuguese couldn't say this is the land of Musa bin Baik they say Mozambique that's how Mozambique became Mozambique like Jabal Tariq Jabal means the mountain of Tariq Tariq was the first Muslim who, con uh, who crossed from Africa into Spain so they can't say Jabal Tariq they say Gibraltar say Mamanilla Manila in the Philippines the Muslim traders were there there was an outpost a Muslim outpost Ma Manullah 
with the help of Allah they reach that distance Ma'manullah this is the money Allah so I said now at the time in 1854 when the whole Muslim world was under under the Christian domination who bribed Lama T tell us who bribed him today yes possible not probable but possible who bribed him no answer Muhammad must be great then 14 years before Lama Teen for the first time in the Western world there was one man who had the temerity or the foolishness to give credit to our Nabi one man Western the first man 1840 a fellow by the name of Thomas Carlyle he is described as one of the greatest thinkers of the past century he delivered a series of lectures in 1840 in London to his Anglican audience Anglican Christian audience under the headings heroes and hero worship and he chose our Nabi Kareem Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as his hero prophet in his theme of lectures his hero prophet was Muhammad not Moses not David not Solomon not Jesus Muhammad was his hero prophet and he gives a lame excuse to his audience as to why he's going to do some justice to this man Muhammad why because he says he's telling them assuring them don't be afraid he said you see as there is no fear he says of any of us him and his other Anglican Christians any of us ever becoming Mohammedans that's the term they use for us we are Muslims but they call us Mohammedans thinking that we are worshippers of Muhammad which we are not see this is the westerner's sickness he is a Christian because he is the worshipper of Christ the worshippers of Christ are Christians the worshippers of Buddha are Buddhists so they think the worshippers of Muhammad must be Mohammedans good logic no, the logic is good, it's right. If they are worshippers of Muhammad, then they will be Mohammedans. But there's nobody worships Muhammad. I don't know in the Maldives if you do that. No. No. Nobody. We have a thousand million Muslims. And we have a lot of lunatic fringes among us. A lot of people with the lunatic ideas. No. Yes. You haven't seen the world. See, there are lunatics also among us. You know, funny, funny ideas they have. But there's not a single lunatic who worships Muhammad. Amazing. We have a lot of other lunacies. But not the worshippers of Muhammad. That lunacy is not there. Five times a day, every day of the year, the Muslim is reminded. In the Azan. anna Muhammad Rasulullah. He said, I bear witness that Muhammad is the messenger of Allah. Ashadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah. He said, I bear witness that Muhammad is the messenger of Allah. He is not God. He is not his son. Don't make a mistake like the others have done. They have made the prophets into gods. They made the heroes into gods. Don't you do that. We are warned. Five times a day. And that warning has gone home. No Muslim ever says Muhammad is God. Anything else? Yes. We will fight over little, little things. Yes. But not this. Muhammad is the messenger of Allah so he says as there is no fear of any of us ever becoming Mohammedans I mean to say all the good things about him that I justly can because there's no fear if he feared that anybody will be converted he wouldn't do justice because people in his time were trained to hate the man Muhammad and his religion. They were trained like dogs are trained in South Africa to hate black people. Dogs are trained. The dogs are colorblind. Of course you won't know. <laughs> you have no dogs. Dogs are colorblind. They can only see black and white and shades of gray. So you can train the dog to do many things, many tricks, but you can't make them to recognize colors. Because between green and blue means the same and red is the same like in black and white TV so they train dogs in my country to hate black people <laughs> you want me to tell you how but of course you won't need it <laughs> you have no dogs here but you want to know how they train dogs to hate black people they train them so the white man the Christian in the West was trained to hate the man Muhammad and his religion trained he gives us example in his lecture about a certain great 
writer of his time, historian, by the name of Pop Cocky. Pop Cocky. Full of Pop Cock. Pop Cocky was his name. This Pop Cocky wrote a book in which he writes about our Nabi Karim Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the Holy Prophet Muhammad. And he says in his book, in this book, that Muhammad had trained pigeons, pigeons, to pick up peas from his ears, peas from his ears. And this Muhammad gave out saying that this is the Holy Ghost, Akhi Jibreel coming and talking to him, giving him, bringing wahi, the revelation, the Quran, in his ears, picking up peas. So he was asked, this pop hockey was asked, where did he get this? This idea that Muhammad had trained pigeons, of course he got it from the Bible. You see, in the Bible they read that when Jesus Christ was baptized in the river Jordan by John the Baptist, the Holy Ghost came from heaven in the shape of a dove, you know, pigeon, alighted, and a voice was heard, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. So, he says, now that idea of the Holy Ghost coming like a dove, pigeon, pigeon. So, they said, well, Muhammad must have, he did also, he trained pigeons to pick up peas from his ears, and you know, put a pea in the ear, and the pigeon is trained to pick it up, so it comes around trying to get it out, and it gets it out, it's happy, it goes away. So, Muhammad says, you see, Allah has sent Akhi Jibreel to me, and he told me to tell the people, Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen, Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim, Malik Yawmiddin. That's what he was giving out. What the pigeon was, he was shooting it himself, concocting it himself. But now, that's what he says, the Holy Ghost. Jibreel, Akhi Jibreel. So he was asked, where did he get this from? He said, no, nowhere. But surely, man, you must have some authority for making statements like this. He said, no, I just felt like writing it. He just felt like it. You know, amazing sickness. You just feel like writing anything, you write anything because it's Muhammad. They have written I've got here some facts here. 60,000 books against Islam since 1800 and 1950 some. 60,000 books against Islam. This is the pastime. This is the pleasure. Professor Edward Said. Professor Edward Said, he is an Orientalist. He is not a Muslim. A Palestinian Christian. He writes in the Times magazine that 60,000 books have been written by Christians against Islam. Do Muslims do that? Have you got time for that? What do you think to do? There's nothing else to do. 60,000 books have been written. And when we talk anything, say, oh, the Muslim is very hard. He's attacking us. When you question them, they say, you're attacking us. We are only asking because they are telling us that we're going to go to hell. And we don't want to go to hell. Who wants to go to hell? Who wants to go to hell? Not even the Hindu. You know, not even the Zoroastrian, he worships fire, but he doesn't want to go inside. Nobody wants to go into the fire, but now they want to send us to hell. He said, look, we don't want to go to hell. They want to save us, but now look, what are you offering us? How are you going to save us? We want to know. So when you start questioning, they say, you're attacking. They can say what they like about the Prophet of Islam, about Islam. They say what they like and they get away with murder. You, but you dare not question them. The most intolerant people, they are the most intolerant people. We listen, listen to all types of rubbish from everybody. And we can smile it off or we say, no man, you have got it all wrong. But the most intolerant of people are the Westerners. They are the most intolerant. They want to give you no peace. They want to pervert you. They are terrified of you. You know that? You're a small nation. But you see, in the ultimate, the people who rule this world, according to Allah's law, will be the righteous, the God-fearing. See, all the civilizations in the world that have gone down, the Roman civilization, the Islamic civilization, the, um, every civilization you can think of that went down, it didn't go down for lack of guns or weapons. Mm -hmm. Morality. Morality was the downfall. The Roman Empire, morality. The Muslims, morality. You leave morals, you go down. There is a law of God, morality, not the lack of guns or atomic weapons. You see what goes down, what takes them down is the morality. What's going on now is not the lack of guns. Russia is inconquerable. America is inconquerable. Militarily, you can't conquer these nations. But what will bring them into the dust is morality. 
and they know that well. The nation, when you study history, every nation has gone down, they didn't lack swords and spears, morality took them into the gutter, destroyed them. And they can see the Muslim world, as bad as we are, as backward as we are, we are the most moral people. And we are destined to rule the world according to that law of God. So how to pervert you, how to make them one of their own? They are rotten to the core, they are rotten to the core, Wallah, if you study them, you don't have to study them, you don't have to, you get their books. The Christians, let them, let them tell you about themselves. Let them tell you, you don't have to go and put your nose into every filth and dirt, every nook and corner to find out what is smelling, you don't have to do that. You ask them, you say, look, let us tell us about yourself. So, the greatest evangelist of the modern age, a fellow by the name of Jimmy Swaggart in America, his daily budget is one million dollars a day. I don't think your, your yearly budget is one million dollars. I don't know. I'm just guessing. Maybe more. I'll, Alhamdulillah. But one million dollars a day, this man's budget. The guy with whom I debated. Swaggart. One million dollars a day. You listen to the tape and you hear me telling him on his face. I says, now, in your December 1985 issue of the Evangelist, your magazine, you say, you, now you need one million dollars a day. Million dollars, how many rupees you count it? Ten million rupees a day, nine million rupees a day. That man has written many books about the shortcomings in his own country. Here is one, incest. He has written this, incest. You know what's incest? Do you people know? All of you know incest. Those who don't know what is incest, please put up your hand. You don't know what's incest. No, there's nothing, nothing to be ashamed of. Wallah, nothing to be ashamed of. A lot of simple words sometimes people don't know. No, this is a technical word, you know, hardly used. You see, when you go along with somebody else's wife or daughter, you do zina, adultery. That's called adultery. Somebody else's wife or daughter, out of marriage, you go along with other people's wives and daughters, that's adultery. That's zina. You know zina. Yes. But if you go with your own mother and sleep with her, your own mother, you use your mother as your wife, you call that incest. Now you understand what is incest. You go and prohibit with your own sister, that is incest. With your own daughter, that's incest. With your own sister is incest. With your daughter-in-law is incest. Now you know what's incest. He says, you know, incest. He says here, yeah, the dark stain on our society, on American societies. 13%, 13 out of every 100 white people, American Christians, they commit incest with their own daughters. They sleep with their own daughters. As, using them as wives, their own daughters. There's no backward nation on earth who does that. He's saying, he's crying. And in this book, in this book, he's giving us that in the Holy Bible, there are 10 cases of incest in this holy book. As if this is the textbook on incest. If you want to know what, what type of incest you can do, get this book. It will tell you 10 different cases of incest. Son, father cohabiting with his daughters is here. Son with his mother is here. Father-in-law with his daughter-in-law is here. Brothers and sisters are here. In this holy book. But they want to push this down your throat. He say, you're going to go to hell with this Quran. You see, you haven't got it. You must put this book away and take this down. It will teach you ten different types of incest. It will teach you. This Quran can't. Wallah, it can't. There is not a single case of incest in this book to tell you. You know, you can do this and that and that and that. There's nothing here. But they're telling you, get rid of this book. Get this and it will take you to heaven. And it will take you to hell here and hell in the hereafter. Both. Jahannam both ways. Here, you'll be in hell. 8% of the whites of South Africa, they commit incest with their own daughters. 8%. That's what they tell us. Maybe more, but they tell us 8% of the white people in South Africa, Christians, they're committing incest with their own daughters. Americans, 13% they commit incest with their own daughters. And that nation is worried about you. They want to take you to heaven. They are in hell now, and they want to take you to heaven. Homosexuality. Homosexual. This is written by the Christians. 
homosexuality. There's another one called Sodom and Gomorrah. You know Luther alayhi salam, his people, Sodom and Gomorrah was destroyed. He says here at the end of one of these two books, he says, America! He says, America, he says, God will judge you. This is what Swagat says. Oh, he's a master, master of speech, the way he does it, beautiful. He says, America, he says, God will judge you. If he does not judge you, he will destroy you. If he doesn't destroy you, he says, he might have to apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah for what he had done to them. You know, we read about Tommy Luth, Allah destroyed them. In other words, Allah destroyed them for this, unnatural lust. For that, Allah destroyed them. He says, you, if God doesn't destroy you, he'll have to apologize. I'm very sorry, you know, I treated you too hardly. God will have to apologize. Make Toba to Sodom and Gomorrah. That's what he says. In other words, you have gone to such lengths. 300,000 Sodomites, Aume Luth, they gathered in San Francisco on a pilgrimage, led by 50 lesbians and motorcycles. And they want to save you. No, they want to corrupt you. They want you to be like them. Then they know you have no chance of ever ruling them. The Muslim world has got no chance. If you behave like them, you will go the same way that they will go. Otherwise, you are destined to rule the world. Allah is telling us in the Quran, He's he given you a deen. He said, Li use a hero who Allah deen a kulli. A deen that is to master, overcome, and supersede them all. Kulli. Whether it be Hinduism, Buddhism, Christianism, Communism, every ism, Islam is destined to master them all. And enough is Allah is Allah a witness to this fact that is going to make his deen to prevail with you or without you. But this is the destiny. How to undo that destiny? Very easy. Come and corrupt you. You want to teach you. You people don't know how to dance. Huh? See, look at every Christian nation. In Africa, they shake their bumps just like the white man. Same, worse. Striptease. They do striptease. You know that? Christian nations. They want you to do the same. What is this clothing you're wearing? You know this Africa, you know you must be lightly dressed. See in South Africa they're wearing skins. Now they don't wear skins, they wear bikinis. Those tangas, I think you see some of them here. You know tangas, G-strings. Just a G-string is enough for them. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> Even that is not necessary. You know for your climate. Look the humidity, I had to take off my jacket. Yeah, they want to destroy you. So this guy, Thomas Carlyle, he says he's doing justice to the Holy Prophet Muhammad and he did some justice because there was no fear. And he says, the word of such a man, he says, to the Arab nation, to the Arab nation, it was as a birth from darkness into light. This book of God, this Quran, this Wahi, this revelation, this message that Muhammad brought, it is as a birth from darkness into light. It's Arabia first became alive by means of it. A poor shepherd people. A poor shepherd people. Roaming unnoticed in its desert since the creation of the world. Nobody gave them a second look. Those barbarians, the Arabs. Nobody gave them a second look. Alexander the Great, if you read history, he passed them by. Rubbish. You'll say, I know these Arabs are rubbish. Nobody's interested in that. The Persians passed them by, the Romans passed them by, every nation just passing them by, rubbish, human rubbish. Liability, anybody will take them up, it will be a liability. This is a poor shepherd people, roaming unnoticed in his desert since the creation of the world. See, the unnoticed becomes world notable. The small has grown world great. Within one century afterwards, Arabia is at Granada on this hand, at Delhi on that. Glancing in valor and splendor and the light of genius, Arabia shines over a great section of the world. Says, Belief is great. Belief, Iman, Yaqeen is great. Life giving, the history of a nation becomes fruitful, soul elevating, great, so soon as it believes. He said, is it not as if a spark had fallen, one spark on a world of what seemed black and noticeable sand. But lo, the sand proves explosive powder, blazes heaven high from Delhi to Granada. This is what Muhammad's teaching did. I'm asking, who bribed Kalai? No. Testimony, greatness, really lies in coming from the mouth of the enemy. What the enemy has to say, we can say good things about our hero. Great things, exaggerations we can. Everybody can. But when it comes from the opposition, 
is the opposition the opposition what he's telling you confirming what allah says wa innaka la ala khuluqin azim say so most certainly thou muhammad stand us on the highest pinnacle of behavior let us send peace and salutations upon the prophet inna allah wa malaikatahu yasalluna ala nabi ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu sallu alayhi wa sallimu taslima allahumma salli ala sayyidina muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa barik wa mr chairman and my dear brothers and sisters we can carry on endlessly but i would like to give you the opportunity maybe you had some little taste yesterday and maybe now today you are a little bolder than yesterday he said now you have so many questions and you'd like to ask me questions i'd like to give you that privilege of answering your questions and for that we don't want to do like what you have been doing yesterday keep on shouting come on man come forward come forward please those of you who have questions boys and girls men and women please if you queue up from here or at least also will know what amount of time to give you all so please so we will not waste time every minute is precious everybody's minutes are precious let us make the maximum use of the time that i'm here so mr chairman with your permission please come out those of you who have questions and one by one ask the question go and sit down and you'll get the answer ask your question go and sit down and you'll get the answer please let's get started jazakallah Quran is the greatest miracle given by Allah to Muhammad and it and it and it will not be cancelled or altered and it will be it will be remain forever can you it will be remain forever then other books can you tell me why this is so right uh the question is that the Quran is the greatest miracle and allah has preserved it and it will remain so forever he would like to know why should it be so uh this is allah's kalam is the last and final revelation of allah bari ta our nabi kareem sallallahu alaihi wasallam allah says he is khatimun nabiyin he is the last of the prophets a prophet is the one who is in direct communication with god with god almighty allah bari ta'ala and if that communication communication is finished then there's no more for the guidance therefore now the guidance that is given must be perfect for all times to suit all our needs answer all our problems and at the same time that book of instruction must be preserved and allah bari ta'ala guarantees that in the quran see the book guarantees itself it says guarantees allah says inna nahnu nazzalna dhikra wa inna lahu lahafizun that it is for us to send down the revelation and it is for us to protect it and we have seen history testifies to this that this is the quran that muhammad left not this printed in durban south africa but the contents inside is the same quran word for word whatever was left by muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam this is the book and in 1400 years from the time of our nabi up to today nobody can bring an iota of evidence one dot of evidence to say that this verse was taken out or this verse was inserted 1400 years friends and foe alike the enemies and friends they all testify that this is the book that muhammad left there is not another book on earth which can boast such preservation that for 1400 years we have not nobody has been able to touch it to add or to delete whereas there are other books in the, on earth like the bible the holy bible this is the holy bible daily it's been changed daily daily see this is what is called the revised standard version of the bible see this one here happens to be the king james version of the bible king james version he said what's the difference the bulk of christians they don't know what's the difference i said look there are chunks and chunks have been taken out of this and thrown away they produce this one chunks and chunks of it you see but the generally ordinary christian doesn't know who produced this christian not produced by muslims or jews or hindus this is produced by christians themselves and they tell you there's so many things that is in here there are so many mistakes errors 
and shortcomings that you know they had to revise it and this system of revising is a continuous process they haven't come to a settlement yet what is in one they take out from the other what is in the other they take out from the other and it's a continuous process because they have not yet finalized that this is the word of God Allah claims that this is my book the Bible doesn't claim that Bible is my book God doesn't say anywhere in the Bible that the Bible is my book there's not another book there is not another book which claims for itself its name this one claims the title Quran for itself says this is by the Quran of full of majesty Quran the Quran names the Quran itself the word Bible in this vast volume the word Bible is not there the word Bible is not there it's on the cover yes see who wrote the cover the God Moses who wrote it nobody this they wrote it they put the Holy Bible that's they wrote that in the whole vast volume inside the word Bible is not in the Bible you know it's amazing amazing you see it's an amazing situation hundred years there are Arab Christians the Arabs of the time they were not they were averse to receiving this message they were not happy with the Quran the Mushriks and he was challenging them they should have produced something he said look Muhammad you say Kul hu Allahu ahad, Allahu samad, lam yalid wa lam yulad. here we have produced this one. they have nothing they could and 1400 years Christian missionaries there are books on Arabic we learn from the Christians Triton a Christian he wrote books who is that guy Lane Lane's lexicon he is the best lexicon means like a dictionary of, of, of Arabic written by who by Christian somebody was showing me in our library you know a concordance of the Quran by Reverend Ahmad Shah Reverend Christian he did the concordance of the Quran right they are great men learned men scholars Christian Arabs but they haven't brought an ayah yet to challenge to confront this book and say look here is something that we can also produce so there are evidences after evidence and our senses tell us what is this man Muhammad talking about it's unlike the Bible unlike the Bible or any other religious book this book is addressing your problems mankind guidance teachings it's not fairy tales you see like I give you an example 10 cases of incest what do you do with that you want to commit incest you want to learn about what you can do is that is that why the book of God is said it's to teach you what what you can do and then you are doing it no, no. here it is this proof any man of sense reason he can see that this is not the book of man this is not the book of Muhammad an illiterate man he didn't know how to read or write he could never have produced this book and answering all your problems the problems of mankind what are your problems come your drunkenness your surplus women come on what problems you have problems are racism every problem this book deals with it if it has no solution then we'll have to look for another book we'll have to wait for another prophet <laughs> but you you won't need that Next. thank you Next. I have three questions I beg your pardon I have three questions three questions no what you do you ask one and you go right at the back <laughs> no no to be fair then when your turn comes again you ask another question and you go to the back give everybody a chance no, no. to be fair because if you ask three by the time you ask three I will have forgotten the two then what happens is this guy evaded the questions so that as well as to be fair to the others one at a time just ask one question and go to the back according to my priority I am starting from question number two and I will go back that's quite all right okay my question number two is Islam permit four wives at a time in certain societies men might take advantage of it men might take advantage of it advantage of it advantage of it in fact they do consequently divorce rate goes high and the women are subjected to untold miseries in such societies can the marriage laws be suitably amended to ensure women's right and honor thank you you can yes take it very good the question was that Islam allows up to four wives 
and there are people who take advantage of this this permission and also they take unfair advantage over our our daughters I know about a man I heard I was shocked that he's been through 24 already he had married 24 women here here one of your one of your uh, uh, multi-whites you know he married 24 women and he divorced one and then he married another and he divorced her and he married another 24 he has gone through already <laughs> and he's got a license it looks like you know your country and your nation gives them the license and your people I don't know what has happened to your brains how can you give your daughter as a 25th how can you give your sister as the 26th there's something damn it all wrong with you and this guy is not the handsomest of fellow you know if you look like me too it might be different he's not like you Allah. what's wrong with you people huh? he's not the richest of men he's not the handsomest of fellow and he's been through 24 already now i said look it's not the fault of of the women is you men people your fathers and your brothers there's something wrong with you i don't know how you can be bought off so easily Islam allows, Allah tells us, marry women of your choice by twos and threes and fours. But if you cannot do justice between them, marry only one. The only religious book on the face of the earth which has this statement, marry only one, is the Quran. There's no other book on earth which says marry only one. So justice is required. Can you do justice? If you can't, you're tempting providence. Then the law has got to come into effect. If there is a Khalifa of the time, the woman has a right to go and complain. He says, look at this guy here. He married us three or two. And now look, he can't even feed the children. He doesn't work. He's sitting in the masjid, reading the tasbih, wasting time, starving the children. He says, Hazrat Umar would have done it right. He did it. There was a man, Sahaba, Muslim, good man. He's sitting in the masjid. Every time he goes to the masjid, he finds this man sitting there. Subhanallah, 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 you know, tasbih. What do you call it? Tasbih. Yes, tasbih, tasbih, shh, shh, salah, tasbih, tasbih. He goes again to the mosque, he finds the guy sitting there. Sir, Hazrat Umar comes to him and says, What do you do? He says, No, I'm making subhanallah. He says, Don't you work? Have you got wife and children? He says, Yes. So What the hell are you doing here? Huh? Come on, get out, go and work. Caught him by the scruff, scruff of the neck and threw him out of the masjid. Yes, go and work, man. Your wife's and children have a right over you your neighbors have a right over you the community has a right over you what are you doing in the masjid so if there is a khalifa or the judge I'm sure you have a qadi you go to the qadi and says look this guy here this is what he's doing to me you have a right to make demands whatever Islam gives you you have a right to ask if you don't get it the guy should be put in jail prison yes but this is a solution to certain problems there are times in, the, in this uh, condition of different nations like in America. There are 8 million women who can't get husbands. Even if every American got married, every male, still 8 million women can't get husbands. So what do you do with them? So these women are breaking other women's homes. They become prostitutes. What else? They are also human. So Islam gives the answer to these problems. If you don't want to listen to the solutions, then they simmer. They were there in the lesbians and the sonoites. This is the answer that they are giving. What's your preference? I would prefer my daughter, my sister, to share a husband with another woman than to become a prostitute. It's left to you now. What you choose for your sister, your daughter. I would prefer my daughter, my sister, to share a husband. If it comes to that, that there are so many women and there are not enough men, I said, well, I rather prefer my daughter to share with another woman a husband. Or with three other women, a husband. Share. Then to become a prostitute, common property of every Tom, Dick and Harry that passes by. No. So Islam gives an answer to a problem. But if people are taking unfair advantage of it, he should be brought to book and given a whipping in the public place. Right. Yes, my son. According to Sharia, if a person dies before his father, then his children do not have inheritance right over the property of their grandfather on which the deceased would have inherit, inheritance right, thus subjecting the orphans on the mercy of their grandfather. In poorer societies, it, it creates a lot of problems to the orphans. How do you justify it? I think, if I got it right, the question is about the laws of inheritance 
about the grandchildren, whether they can inherit from the grandfather's state. Is that what it is? Yes. Yes. And uh, you know what can happen and what not. Uh, see now, this, uh, this, uh, this is a question pertaining to the Jews of Islam. You know, people who do this justice, who do, who do Sharia, Fiqh. I am an expert in comparative religion. I haven't been to a Darul Ulum. I didn't go to a college or university, nothing. You see, I have been talking, talking, experience brought me to this position. My experience has been with Jews, against Jews, Christians, Hindus, atheists, agnostics. Now, when you have problems of that nature, you say, look, the atheists said this. The Christians said, why don't you eat pig? Anything like that, you come to me that this is what the Christians say, this is what the Hindu says against Islam. What is the answer? Most probably I'll have it for you. But when you ask about fiqh, I haven't been to the Al-Azhar. You know, our Sheikh, our Sheikh, our Sultan, you know, our President, he's been. And I saw him on, on video that there were a group of people questioning him, firing him with question. And I can assure you that he'll be able to do a better job, not against Swagat, but in answering your question. He'll do a better job than what I can do. So wait for the next opportunity when there is such a meeting that your president, Mamun Abdul Qayyum, you know, when he is allowing people to question him, you be there and you fire him. Okay? Yes, with a question. <laughs> with a question. Fire him with a question. And if he refuses to answer, you write to me. Then I'll write back to him. Alright? Yes. Some of us have heard that you have met the Pope. Could you please give us a brief of your me meeting with the Pope? Uh, I think the question is, our brother seems to have misunderstood that I met the Pope and he wants me to give an explanation of what happened when I met His Holiness, His Holiness, the Pope, you know, Baba, in Rome. Uh, you see, His Holiness, the Pope, there was some relationship between me and him, but it was all by correspondence. Personally, I haven't met him yet. You see, His Holiness, the Pope, the Arabs call him Baba, they call him Baba. When he went to Turkey, he made a pronouncement and I'm quoting him. He said, we must have a dialogue with the Muslims. When he went to Kenya, he said, we must have a dialogue with the Muslims. When he went to Nigeria, he said, we must have a dialogue with the Muslims. What is a dialogue? A dialogue is a two-way process. We, we have certain problems and we discuss, you make your contribution, I make mine and we come to a solution, answer to the problem. That is the dialogue. Is that what he's telling the people? No. Actually he's playing a game. He's a master psychologist. This Pope, this present Pope is the most popular Pope they had in a thousand years. He is the most psychological Pope in a thousand years. This Polish Pope. Wherever he goes, I give you example, he goes and kisses the ground and he makes the Muslim happy, he makes the Hindu happy, he makes the Christian happy. Master psychologist. When he says about dialogue, he is actually telling his people, go and convert the Muslims. But he doesn't use the word convert, because if he uses the word convert, the Muslim is going to react. Because when his priest will come along with his dog collar, you know the collar turned upside down. He says, good morning, good morning. You know, straight away he's come to steal your children, want to come to pervert your children. So you say, get rid of him somehow. Some excuse, get him out of the house. But if he talks about dialogue, you can't say no. Because Allah tells us to have a dialogue with him. In the Quran, Allah says, pull, tell them. Ya Ahlul Kitab, O people of the book, O Jews and Christians, ta'ala, come. Ila kalimatin sawa im bainana wa bainakum. That we come to common terms as between us and you. Let us get onto a common platform. Let's come to some agreement. About what? So Allah na buda illallah that we worship none but Allah. Wala nushrika bihi shay'an and that we associate no partners with him. Wala yattakhiza ba'duna ba'dan arbaban min dunillah and that we do not take from among ourselves lords and patrons other than Allah. Fa in tawallaw fa kullu shahadu bi anna muslimun but if they turn back tell them that we are Muslims we have submitted our wills to the will of Allah. This is Allah is telling us to have a dialogue with him and he wants to have a dialogue with you. We can't say no. But he doesn't mean that. I knew the game that he was playing. 
So I wrote to him, I said, Your Holiness, His Holiness, respectfully, you are talking about dialogue, dialogue, dialogue. I said, look, I am prepared to come along and have a dialogue with you in St. Peter's in Rome, in your own hometown, in your own home. I've been there, see, once before, I passed through Rome, I went to the Vatican, and I've been to the St. Peter's in Rome, huge church, huge. It's unimaginable in size, unimaginable. And there's a huge square in front of that St. Peter's. I said, now that's the right place. You tell me when, I am prepared to come down. You talk about a dialogue, we want to have a dialogue with you. Because the Quran tells us also have a dialogue with you. We want to have a dialogue. No reply. So I sent him another letter. No reply. I sent him a telegram. No reply. I sent another telegram. Look, when you start something, you don't let go. Others don't start. So comes the reply. He's prepared to receive me in the secretariat, meaning in private. I said, look, this is not a matter between Ahmad Dilat and the Pope. This is a matter between Islam and Christianity. I met the president this morning. That's private. You see, we sat down as friends and we chatted. That's something different. This guy is talking, he's a thousand million Muslims on one side are involved. One thousand two hundred million Christians are involved on the other side. Everybody wants to know what you're talking. What did you discuss? Everybody wants to know. He wants in private. So I asked him, I said, how big is your secretariat? You want to have it in the secretariat? How big is it? Because three plane loads of young men from South Africa want to come to the dialogue. Three plane loads, they want to charter special planes. My people are enthusiastic, very enthusiastic. There was a rumble in the jungle in Zaire, you know, that Muhammad Ali and Foreman, they had a boxing match. You People didn't even know in the world what is Zaire. But whole world came to know Muhammad Ali and Foreman, heavyweight championship goal in the jungle, bum, rumble in the jungle. So everybody came to know, you know, boxing match in Zaire. Others, they won't know where Zaire is, like the Maldives. You see, I came to know Maldives because of my Libyan brother. You know, they had this conference here that enabled me to come here. And I'm telling everybody where my Maldives is, you see. <laughs> say. So, three plane loads of young men want to go. How big is the secretary? No reply. I sent him another letter. No reply. I sent him a telegram. Have you received my correspondence? No reply. But through the post, I get this picture. This picture of His Holiness, the Pope, playing hide and seek. Look, look, it's pass it on. But you know, please don't own it. Just pass it on. They can just have a good look. You're going to kiss him, kiss him, but pass it on and let the people see. Yeah. Just pass it on. Don't give it to you. Just pass it through. You know, just have a good look. You know how His Holiness is playing hide and seek. In Urdu they say, Aak micholi khelenge, hum aak micholi khelenge. You know, little children play hide and seek. He's playing hide and seek. So actually, see it's a game, a game he was playing with the Muslim. And I, I, I sense that. I didn't you know, to prove it, I meet Dr. Abdullah Nasif of the Rabita in Jeddah. I meet him in Birmingham at a luncheon. Somebody had given us luncheon and then we are sitting together. So Abdullah Nasif is asking me, we are on first name relationship. Was Ahmad, what happened about that dialogue of yours? So I explained, I said, no, that fellow was playing the fools with the Muslims, man. You know, he was making a fool of us and I caught him out because I caught him that what he was trying to do is playing fools with us. He says, you know, Ahmad, he did it to me. So what? He said, he did it the same thing to me. So what did he do? Dr. Abdullah Nasif of the Rabita. He said, he did it to me. What did he do? He said, he called me for a dialogue. And I went. He said, Bhole Bhale Musliman. You know, simple Muslims. We are all like simpletons. You know, simpleton? Simpleton in English? What do you mean? Tons of simplicity. Huh? <laughs> simpleton means bloody fools. <laughs> you know that? Idiots, idiots. Simpleton doesn't mean full of simplicity. See, Mr. Didar, he's such a simple fellow. You know, he felt also oh, he took off the jacket and you know, <laughs> he had rolled up his sleeve and you know, he was, you know, just informal like any one of us. It's all going down now. Okay. 
say simple is something and simple tongue is another. We Muslims are treated like simple tongues, idiots. So he went and he said, they, he, they, I was received, well received in the waiting room. I sat down for 10 minutes waiting to see His Holiness, the Pope. Then they took me into another waiting room, a higher grade. I sat there waiting for the Pope, His Holiness. Then they took me to another waiting room. Great, great, you're going as if you're going to meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, Lika Allah. You know, he said, have a, the vision of God. Stop. This Pope now, you, suspense is being created. One level, another level, another level, and in comes the Pope. Charming, charming. I don't know whether he embraced him, kissed him, I don't know. But, he said, you're from Egypt. So Abdullah Nasir said, no, I'm from Saudi Arabia. See, maybe they were fishing for some Egyptians. He was fishing for some Egyptians. Maybe there were some Egyptians also on the line, in a queue, waiting somewhere. So he said, no, I'm from Saudi Arabia. So the Pope says, you know, you don't allow us to build churches in your country. So Dr. Abdullah Nasif said, he said, you allow us to build mosques in the Vatican? You allow us to do that? He said, no, 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 I don't in Mecca and Medina, but in the rest of the country. He said, look, we allow you people freedom of religion, for you people to have your services, but you have been using each and every place of worship as a center for Christianizing the Buddhists from, from since, uh, from Ceylon, from Korea, and the uh, people from the Philippines, from, from all over the world, when they come, the Hindus and all, you are trying to Christianize them all. You are using them as centers of Christianity in our countries. Is that what Allah wants you to have a dialogue about? No. Allah says, Allah na'muda illallah. That is what you are going to talk about. Not about, you know, your fishes are too expensive. You know, can't you reduce the price of fish or the price of oil or the price of onions in your country? Is that what you want to talk about? No. Allah tells you what to talk about. I go to Malaysia. I meet Tunku Abdul Rahman, the old president, prime minister of Malaysia. So he also came to know around that time. He said, look, Ahmad, what happened about your dialogue with the Pope? <laughs> I can't blame the young man from asking the same question. Everybody was, what happened? So I told him what had happened. He says, you know the guy did it to me? I said, what did he do to you? He says, he called me for a dialogue. And he says, I went. <laughs> he's catching everybody out. He's making fools out of everybody. The Muslim is so simple. He says, yeah, a dialogue. So what dialogue? Of the missionaries, these Catholics were caught drug smuggling, drugging. And the penalty is the penalty there for drugs in Sabah. So I said, look, can't you intercede on our behalf to the Sabah government to let our people go? <laughs> is that what Allah wants you to have a dialogue about? No, they have been making fools out of us left, right and center. And if you allow that guy to come into your country, Wallah, you would have started an opening of a rot. Cancer, cancer in the country. I don't know who made the decision to keep the fellow out. I said, keep them out, keep them out. They want to pollute you, pervert you. If they want to have a talk, they say, look, my uncle D-Dad is there. We'll send him over. I'll go and do the talking for you. Keep them out. You know, any Americans say, look, you go and arrange the meeting in the Madison Square Garden and we'll send uncle D-Dad there. You talk with him there in your country. Inshallah. Uh, we, the Muslims, believe that everything was created and programmed by God, Allah Ta'ala. And we also heard that life history of a human being is written and programmed before his birth. If it is so, what is our fault for committing a sin? I think what uh, the young man is, is wants to know is that Allah created man and with his life history written like takdeer, his takdeer is all written down that you will be a rapist, you will be a murderer, you will be a thief, you will be a cutthroat, you will be a cheat. Everything was written down. Huh? That. See? And then now, uh, if that is so, Allah wrote these things down for me, Ahmad Didad, you know, what a horrible fellow will be, Hitler, he's going to kill six million Jews, incinerate them. How can God make him to account for it? That's a very fair question. If God wrote that Hitler must incinerate six million Jews, how can God ask him, hey, why did you incinerate six million Jews? Because Allah wrote it, he must do it. If Allah wrote 
that you know mama spank somebody innocently on the jaw and so i got to do it then your lord nobody can catch me so look, allah said hit him so i hit him what did i do <laughs> no you see what it actually means is, is that allah knows allah knows everything about everybody but he didn't write it he didn't make you to do it see that's quite a different thing from knowing knowledge is one thing and making you to do is another thing see we have certain knowledge we have certain knowledge like the false i know you don't know about false wagon motor car you see i own a false wagon beetle motor car oh you know about boats you see and in the boat you see you buy a new boat i buy a new boat i'm a stranger as i got a lot of money as i want to buy a boat and i want to go one of your islands that furthest island that you're in your uh, country i want to visit the place so i get a pilot see and i bought the boat as a fill up petrol so he fills up the tank so i go move he says sir you see this thing this amount of petrol we need spare drums of petrol i said no i got plenty of money in my pocket he said look money is no good what you need is petrol i'm stubborn i said no man is a brand new boat and the tank is full of petrol you take me to my destination he says sir you know it won't go beyond that certain island is telling you sir you on that certain island you know you see on the map that beyond this way it won't go i said the man is a brand new boat full of petrol bro says sir right. bus said i told you so, you move so he goes and around the island he was telling me the boat finish now am i going to blame the pilot i said you damn fool why you get stuck here says, sir i told you How, how what made him to tell me that is he god <laughs> huh no from experience he knows that this amount of petrol can only take you halfway so that is through experience knowledge our knowledge is acquired knowledge we can predict so many things you behave like this my son you won't go very far sooner or later somebody is going to break your jaw you know the way you are behaving looking for a fight looking for trouble everywhere so look you won't go very far before you go around the corner somebody will bash you what makes me to say that i know from experience that you can't behave like that and get away you get the idea so from experience i'm telling you from experience the pilot is telling me our knowledge is dependent upon experience knowledge allah's knowledge is self knowledge to him everything is now here past present future is an open book so it is in his knowledge but he hadn't written you do this and you do that if he had written then there is no accounting but there is no written see this is people talk like that is written is not written it is in his knowledge next one i think the queue is increasing this is only 2 minutes more this is the last question this will be i'm very very sorry my brother with the three questions you know i don't know whether it's still there but uh, you appreciate yes this is the last question uh, it's it's every good thing has an end you agree and i am an old man to old machine i am sweating to uh, it's said that everybody is born to the to this world as a as an innocent and uh, clean baby now say when he when his parents when he's bringing up he is converted to christian and he was uh, this baby was uh, died before uh he was too young to know what is right and what is wrong so who is who will be punished for this every individual will have to account for himself according to his knowledge according to his opportunities all these factors are taken into account before allah passes judgment he is not unjust if you never heard the name god allah in your life in a primitive society let's say this multi violence nobody heard the name god nobody heard the name allah and they live like animals according to the own you know primitive standards allah will not ask you why didn't you believe in my jesus why didn't you believe in my muhammad why didn't you fast why didn't you make hajj no no questions each will be asked according to his experience knowledge know how capacity so if the child born to muslim parents but somehow the christians you know 
uh, these missionaries they take over the child and Christianize the child and the child in his life or in her life never comes across any other knowledge except what was brainwashed into it Allah will be more merciful to that person than to the guy to whom knowledge, instructions, corrections have been delivered so everybody will be given an opportunity according to his knowledge, background and experience opportunity no opportunity can't be had. Allah will be merciful. But we will be questioned. Suppose we had an opportunity like in my country. The Muslim is in big trouble in my country. Because we have non-Muslim women working for us. Non-Muslim men working for us. And we are too busy to deliver the message. You too. If there are people working with you who are Christians. Or working for you who are Christians. And if you don't deliver the message, you are in trouble. You see, because Allah will ask you on the day of judgment. Didn't you deliver the message to that person that he was going off the track? He said, no, Baritala. I said, why not? I was too busy. Sir, you're too busy doing what? Looking video. Did that videos. Huh? That's no redeeming grace. You will do that videos. You are in trouble. So, everybody, according to his opportunity and capacity, he will be judged. Inshallah. Brothers and sisters, ladies and gentlemen, that concludes the session on Muhammad the Greatest. Now, uh, Mr. Didat will be leaving us tomorrow. That's leaving Maldives. So, on behalf of all the audience and the Maldives Youth Center, we thank you very much, Mr. Didat, for spending this yesterday and today with us. We indeed have benefited much. Thank you very much.